Hi, on Sunday, April 11th, 2021, I'm Reverend Mike Ratti for Farringdon Church in Brantford, Ontario. Coming to you from my house because we're shut down for the month by provincial lockdown. But it's a wonderful spring day, and I'm trusting and praying for you that God meets you right where you are. Let us pray and then hear from John's Gospel. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are a God who not only makes wonderful promises, but you keep every promise you make. You've promised us life and peace and joy, and not one of your words ever fails. We praise you for sending your Son, Jesus, to us to bring us a new covenant sealed in his blood. And so though our sins were as scarlet, you've washed us white as snow. We praise you that you're here with us now by your Spirit. Whether outdoors or indoors or in Brantford or another town, and in this pandemic, we can feel lonely at times. But Lord, we're never alone because of you. You've promised to never leave us or forsake us. You've given us power so we can endure. We can resist the enemy and say no to every temptation. Lord, we pray for those uh, who are in need today. Prove yourself faithful to them. Give them the faith to call out to you in their trial that you might save them. And thank you for protecting us from the virus. And uh, we pray for its end. So many things we took for granted before, Lord, we don't anymore. We say thank you for all our blessings. Now ask, uh, we ask you to cause the entrance of your word to give us light. Light for our path, life for our souls, and love for our neighbors. We pray for Jesus' sake and in his name. Amen. First of all, John fourteen twenty seven. Jesus says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give you. So don't be troubled or afraid. And then John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Now one of the twelve disciples named Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So they told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Well, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were still locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. 
Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas exclaimed, My Lord, my God. Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who have believed in me, though they've not yet seen me. This is God's word for which we say, thanks be to God. friends, it's Caitlin here from Farringdon Church, and we're back online this morning with our family Sunday morning devotions. This morning to get started, we are going to read some Bible together, and we're going to be reading uh, the story about Jesus and him appearing to his disciples after he's risen from the dead. So we're going to be reading from John chapter 20, and we're going to read several verses. It was the first day of the week. That evening, Jesus' followers were together. The doors were locked because they were afraid. Then Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. His followers were very happy when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I now send you. Thomas was not with the followers when Jesus came. Thomas was one of the twelve disciples. The other followers told Thomas, We saw the Lord! But Thomas said, I will not believe it until I see the nail marks in his hands, and I will not believe until I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side. A week later, the followers were in the house again. Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came in and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand here in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you see me. But those who believe without seeing me will be truly blessed. Well, I wonder how many of you like to read. If you like to read, I want you to comment down below and let me know what your favorite thing to read is. Maybe it's a picture book, maybe it's a graphic novel, or perhaps it's even a chapter book. When I was around eight to 10 years old, I really didn't enjoy reading. It was a chore, I couldn't find anything that was interesting to read, and when I'd go to the library, I struggled to find a book. Then, one day, I found the Ripley's Believe It or Not books. Now these books are filled with all kinds of weird and strange stories and all kinds of fun photos. I really like to pick these up off of the library shelves and take them away with me 
and learn about all the weird things happening in the world around us. I thought this morning I would share two strange stories with you from inside this Ripley's book. So the first one is about a group of people in Germany. I'm gonna hold this up here. I hope that you can see it. And it's all about these people who would leave work early on a Friday afternoon and they would head to their streets in costumes and decked out office chairs and they would have office chair races. Now I feel like if we saw that around here we'd think it was strange. Now the second story I want to share with you today is about a place in California. Down in the US there is a wall completely made out of gum and a lot of people believe that it's not just fun to chew and stick your gum on the wall, but it also brings you good luck if you lick some of the gum that's already on the wall. That is a situation that I would have to see in order to believe. Today in our Bible reading, we hear about a situation in which one of the disciples just couldn't believe without seeing. We hear about Thomas. Thomas was known as the disciple who doubted. And in our story today, we hear how he doubted that Jesus had been risen from the dead. We heard about how Jesus appeared to the disciples in a locked room. How he appeared to them and said, I'm alive, now go and do good works in my name. See, unfortunately, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. And when the disciples told Thomas all about this, he did not believe. He said, until I see his nail-pierced hands, and until I can place my hand in his side where the soldiers pierced his body, I just can't believe. About a week later, in the same locked room, Jesus appeared yet again to his disciples. And this time, Thomas was there. Jesus approaches Thomas, and he tells Thomas, come here. Look at my hands. Look at my side. It is I. Thomas looks at Jesus and he says, It is you. You are the Christ. Jesus' words to Thomas are bold. He tells Thomas, You believe because you have seen me. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. A lot of people in the world around us don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead because they haven't seen it with their own eyes. But today Jesus' words to Thomas reign true for each one of us. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Our Ripley's Believe It or Not book tells us all kinds of amazing stories that we might have to see in order to believe. But today I want to remind you of another book, a book that is filled with amazing stories that reality is we're never going to be able to see in order to believe. Our Bible is filled with amazing stories, miracles, and exciting situations that we are encouraged by the words of Jesus to simply believe even though we have not seen. So this week, the week following Easter, I want to encourage you to continue reflecting on the great amazing miracle that was Jesus' death and resurrection. And pull out your Bibles and read through the stories inside of it. If you don't know where to start, start where I did. And check out John chapter 20. Read through the amazing story of Jesus appearing to Thomas and the rest of the disciples. Let's pray together this morning. Dear God, when Jesus died and rose again, he broke all the rules of this world. He conquered and defeated death. For some of us, believing that truth is simple, while others of us have our doubts. Would you help us to understand this beautiful truth more and more every day? Amen. Well, friends, I hope you have an amazing Sunday. Bye. Winston Churchill told the story of a bunch of wild animals who met together for their own peace summit because they had grown frustrated with how often they were fighting and killing each other. So they met to set some ground rules for how they can live in peace. Mr. Owl chaired the meeting. 
He said to live in peace, we all have to lay down our own personal weapons. So lion, no more using your, your fangs and your teeth. And rhino, no more jabbing with your horn. Tiger, no more clawing at us. And uh, cobra, no more spitting with your poison. And the deer thought, well, this is a great plan. But the wild beast wasn't so happy. He said, well, then how will we solve our differences? Mr. Owl thought, and he didn't have a solution. So he asked the group, anybody, what, how do you think we can solve our differences without killing each other? And uh, Mr. Bear put up his paw and said, how about we just hug each other from now on? Now, at first hearing, some might think, oh, that's cute. The wild animals are going to hug each other and get along and not fight anymore. But that's not why Churchill told it. You know what a bear hug is, right? And how it can suffocate you. His point was that some people talk about peace. But that's it. They just talk about it. They're not willing to live it. They're not willing to lay their own weapon down. Why is it that we can have peace talks and sign peace treaties and sing about peace, march for peace, and never achieve it? During the pandemic, murders have escalated in the United States. A survey of 34 American cities was just completed. And murders are up by at least 30% in those cities. New York City up 44%. Chicago 55% more murders than before the pandemic. Why can't we live in peace? Well, the Bible tells us why. And it's called S-I-N. Sin. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 22. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. See, to have peace, we must, first of all, be righteous, not wicked. We must worship God. Righteousness and peace are two sides of the same coin, the Bible says. In fact, Isaiah 60 verse 17 equates the two. Righteousness will rule you, and peace will govern you. Whenever we ignore God and live our own way, peace will be absent. It's just a law. So Jesus says to his disciples in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Now, this is the Last Supper, the night before he will be crucified. And one of the last things he says to them is, Take my gift of peace, this peace I give you. It's not like the world's peace. So right there we know there are two kinds of peace, worldly peace and godly peace. Worldly peace we buy in a bottle of pills or, or a bottle of something else, or we pay $20,000 to fly to a remote location, or we can just sit on a beach and have people serve us, or we go to a spa day once a week. Okay, th that's a kind of peace. But Jesus' peace doesn't cost. It's free. It's a gift. We receive it from him alone. Worldly peace lasts just a short while, until the pills or the bottle runs out, until the vacation ends, or the spa people say, all right, see you next week. As long as the place I'm in is peaceful and the people around me are peaceful and nice, then I'm at peace. See, it's, it's circumstantial. It's temporary. But Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. It's not temporary. It's permanent. It doesn't come and go with the weather. Because it's tied to Jesus himself. 
Here, let my peace. It's personal. It's relational. Not a theory. Not a concept. God's peace is wrapped up in his Son, our Savior. And as long as we have him, then we have his peace. Jesus said this on the night of his betrayal, about to be arrested, then beaten to death. Yet he has peace to give away? So God's peace, it's available 24-7, no matter what situation we're in, what storm or what cross is in front of us. It's not something we create or cook up. It's a gift from the Prince of Peace. So back to our first point. Peace and righteousness are tied. They're two sides of the same coin. Jesus, the righteous one, is the Prince of Peace. And so apart from him, there's no real, no lasting peace. Just a temporary, worldly, disappointing facsimile of it. Now, the last thing Jesus says to him before he dies is the first thing he says to them when he's alive again. We go to John 20, verse 19. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, when suddenly Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Verse 21, again he says, Peace be with you. 24, Thomas was not with the others when Jesus came. So eight days later, when they were together again with Thomas, the door still locked. But suddenly, as before, Jesus stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. Three times he says, Not hi, how are you? But shalom, peace be upon you. Shalom is God's peace. It, it's wholeness. Somebody said uh, another definition for peace is just that lull in the fighting. Those moments when we get to reload. Yeah, not God's peace. It's permanent. It's whole life. So why does Jesus talk to them so much about peace before he dies and as soon as he sees them uh, on that Sunday? Obviously, they needed it. They weren't at peace. We heard verse 19. They're meeting behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. Also in 26, eight days later, still hiding, locked doors, fearing the government. They're afraid they too will get arrested and tortured. So they quarantine themselves. Self-imposed stay-at-home order. And that's no way to live, as we know. It can only go on for so long. Something has to change. I think there are people today living in a prison of fear. Fearing people. Fearing the disease, fearing whatever trouble is on the horizon, they lack peace. Years ago, people used to talk about Chuck Norris. On the internet, they would spread sayings and memes about him. People who didn't even know that he was a martial arts black belt expert. But uh, referring to just how tough and brave and everything he was, they would say things like, the dinosaurs were disrespected Chuck Norris. Now where are they? Chuck Norris counts to infinity every day. My favorite is, Chuck Norris isn't afraid of the dark. The dark's afraid of Chuck Norris. What we see in the Gospels, these disciples are no Chuck Norris. Norris. They're afraid of the dark, their own safety, you name it. Why did Peter deny Jesus three times? 
He was afraid. Afraid of getting caught. Why in John 19, 38 does it say Joseph of Arimathea secretly goes to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus to bury him? He goes secretly because it says he's afraid of the Jewish leaders. In fact, that passage, he's called a secret believer. And with him is Nicodemus, it says, who had gone to Jesus at night. Why go to Jesus at night when it's dark and no one can see? Because you fear what might happen to you. These grown men are are afraid. They lack peace like you and me. That's why Jesus says repeatedly, my peace I give you. Receive my peace. Jesus may have three-peated the greeting of peace to cancel out Peter's three-peat denial of him. You deny me, receive my peace. You're afraid? Have my peace. You don't know me? Peace be with you. Wouldn't you like to trade your fear for his peace? I know I sure do. We can. And God invites us to with Philippians 4, 6, and 7. He says, don't be anxious. Easier said than done. But instead of being anxious, here's the solution. Present your requests to God with thanksgiving. And then the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. That picture of guarding heart and mind, it's of an army that surrounds someone. So they're protected on all sides. No enemy can get through. And so when we pray to God with thanksgiving, telling him our needs and our fears, the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus, surrounds us so the enemy can't get through to harm us. But only those who have peace with God can have the peace of God in their lives. Now, I've heard many Christians tell me they've experienced this peace when they were at the lowest point of their life, facing surgery, the death of their spouse, illness of a child, unemployment, whatever the storm. They told me that as they prayed, God seemed to feel nearer. The burden seemed to grow lighter. The way looked a little clearer. God didn't stop the storm around them. He didn't raise their spouse to life. Didn't cure their child like that. But he calmed the storm within them. He increased their confidence or their faith level in him. Occasionally in life we'll get a miracle like that. Where God says, okay, this painful trial, you don't have to go through it. Most often, though, he says, no, I'm going to let you go through that painful trial. So you can know for sure how real and how strong is my peace. Peace in the midst of your storm. And God's peace is not this Zen-like state where we just, well, float on a cloud above all the cares down below on earth. Again, that's like worldly peace, where we just kind of get numb. We, We tune out. We get dull in our senses and our feelings. It's like we escape the reality for a while. That's not God's peace. No, he keeps us in reality, but instead strengthens us in our, what the Bible calls our inner man, our spirit. So we can face the problem with confidence in him. That really is what peace is. A deep confidence that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. That though I'm limited in my abilities, he's unlimited in his abilities. And he'll bring me through. For he's promised, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll love you to the end. And nothing can harm you. 
For I take everything and work it together for your good and my glory. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, even had this peace on the cross, though he was in physical pain. That's why he could pray confidently, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He knew God was in charge even of his death. That's why he could even say no to the the wine-soaked sponge, a a painkiller that they offered him. No, I don't need that. For he had the peace of God to sustain him through his storm. Now, that doesn't mean faith and medicine are opposites. One or the other, you either take Prozac or you pray. Christians pray and others take Prozac. For some reason, I naively thought that as a young Christian. Until I got sick. Years ago, I was in a situation where everything was just really out of my control. I had a lot to fear. My worries kept me up at night. I was losing sleep. That, of course, made me more emotionally unstable. And things got so dark that I I called my doctor one day and I said, I have to see you today. And the receptionist said, well, we could book you in Friday at 2. And I said, I, I may not have till Friday at 2. I'm coming there now, and I'll wait all day if I have to. And I went, and the doctor made room and prescribed counseling and pills. Pills so I could get back to regular sleep routine which helped, calmed my nerves, my body was stronger, began to eat more regular exercise properly. I became healthier that way. With the counselor, thankfully a godly person, I saw very clearly how I was trying to face everything in my own strength, trying to figure it all out myself. Instead of taking God up on his offer, present your petitions to me with thanksgiving, and I'll in exchange give you my peace, which passes all understanding. It was such a simple but vital lesson to learn. On our own, we don't have what it takes. There is much to fear in this world. We have uncertain days. Trouble surrounds us. And of course, we will lack peace if we try and face it in our own strength. Instead, the Prince of Peace says, Don't. My peace I give you. Receive from me. I had to learn that. Now, my problems, again, didn't vanish like that. My situation Externally didn't change much, but internally it sure did. I felt God's nearness. I felt a new confidence that he's going to bring me through this, and so I have nothing to fear. I invite you to trade your fears for his peace. For the risen Lord stands today among his disciples saying, peace I give you. My peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. Receive the Prince of Peace today. He'll make all the difference in your life too. We take part in communion once a month at Farringdon, and I invite you to go get some bread and some wine or juice, so you can take part with me. Again, the good news is that though we're separated physically, we're bound together spiritually by the Lord Jesus himself. We are his body. And he commands us to remember him in this way. 
I'm going to start with the Apostles' Creed. And if you know it, you quote it along with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, that your broken body makes us whole, gives us peace with God. Thank you for taking our pain, our punishment, for our sin. Amen. And then after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And Jesus, we praise you that your blood cancels every sin and washes us clean. You gave your very life so that we can live. We will forever be grateful. Now, if you again know the Lord's Prayer, join me as we conclude. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless and keep you close to him until we can see each other again, either this way or hopefully in person.